I want to reflect a bit on the recent significant changes in the social role of the planner. And I'll start with a quote. Um, the quote goes, uh, finally, I can practice planning and architecture for my own satisfaction and not to reform society. Guesses. Anyway, I, I don't have time to allow you to guess, but this comes from Philip Johnson, the once great advocate of architecture and planning as a social art. It comes in 1982 and it captures perfectly the moment of a paradigm shift in the role of the planner from a public visionary intellectual to an agnostic intellectual, a professional technocrat, artist, or craftsman. I mean, this shift did not come in a void. It came after decades of fierce criticism about the top-down ways in which planning, hand-in-hand -hand with welfare state, produced spaces that were oppressive, monotonous, unobservant of ethnic, gender, and other differences. All correct. What did we do with response to this criticism? We changed. We turned to Jane Jacobs. We, her call for a pluralistic bottom-up community planning. We changed our institutions. We broadened participation, developed a new planning paradigm committed to bottom-up processes. We proved that communities matter and we took them seriously. But Jacobs' call did not find fertile ground in the 80s only because we received criticism. It found fertile ground in the 80s because it fitted so perfectly well within the shift to an aggressive neoliberal economy. And I, it, this may sound like a bit of a contradiction, but I'll explain what I mean. Because this new economy called not only for market freedom and withdrawal of the state, the new economy all, also invited for a big society to develop. Yeah. This kind of uh, somewhere in the ether that would develop a, a big society who would bypass oppressive top-down state and planning institutions, a big society that would sit down in the negotiated table directly with the markets and with developers, and they would find together innovative market-driven solutions for provision of pensions, of housing, of education, healthcare, urban development, you name it. The markets demanded a god citizens to turn their welfare into a private affair, to turn their right to the city into the right to buying the city. So I think it was, it's important to put this community planning paradigm into its proper socioeconomic context because I want to make two points. First is that the shift to community planning gave us planners the perfect alibi to become promoters of the most aggressive neoliberal projects while keeping our souls clean we were declaring we were doing it all in the name of community empowerment community planning became the perfect alibi for developers to destroy historical sites historical communities to gentrify to disenfranchise you name it and though it is true that um, modernist planning top-down decisions that were piling up ethnic minorities into high-rise blocks had been violent acts. They were crimes against these communities. But our own acts performed in the name of community participation, I argue, have been equally violent. Is it not violent to throw community representatives unprepared, unarmed, unskilled into negotiating tables with preset agendas and then literally watch them being devoured by the superior knowledge, power, and expertise of developers and some planning consultants? Is it not violent to ask people who lack the time and resources to fence off aggressive urban development plans or to make communities withdraw their resources to, to hire planning consultants to do what they cannot do? Is it not violent to treat unequals as equals? I think that's what we've been doing, and I'm being a bit provocative, but I, I think there is an element of truth in that. Mm -hmm. Now, what did we achieve by this consensus building exercises that treated unequals as equals? We achieved increases in income inequalities and educational attainment, and of course, a sharp rise in environmental destruction. It's not what we wanted, but it's what we got. And what did we do? Because we didn't want that. We spent almost 30 years doing damage control. We turned planning into an immunological exercise. We vaccinated societies so that they can take even more distraction and inequality in the future. 
We promoted smarter technological solutions, smarter managerial solutions for communities to be more resilient to aggressive housing markets, etc. And we did well, there's nothing wrong with practicing planning as immunology or damage control. But today, more and more communities across the world actually refuse to be content with damage control. They refuse to be immunized, they refuse to be called resilient. Communities in Louisiana who were praised for their resilience for years because they were hit by both Hurricane Katrina and the BP oil disaster, they launched a campaign saying, just stop calling me resilient because the more resilient I become, it means that you can do more damage, more destruction to me. I don't want to be called resilient. I want to address the issues that made me need to become resilient in the first place. So what to, what, what to do? Um, I think it's very important and I'm echoing almost everybody who spoke in front of me a bit before me. And I'm so happy you all did. We need to make planning a political act again, not a technical question. How? By stop treating planning as a consensus building exercise. Democracy has never been a consensus building exercise. From its conception, democracy has been a continuous agonistic process, a continuous a debate and disagreement between equals, a political space where power does not have a fixed location or a person. So let us dare to practice democracy through planning again. How? By forgetting about, well, not forgetting about, but paying a bit less attention to consensus building exercises and pay more attention to dissensus practices. Focus of pra on practices of dissent in uh, communities and groups that do not wish to participate in consensus building panels and instead they produce new methods and new radical imaginaries for social and environmental inequality. I'm not talking about protest groups. There's nothing we can do with protest groups. I'm not talking about slacktivism. I'm talking about groups who formed communities by often sacrificing, sacrificing certainly their time, but even their personal lives to do that. Um, seek out these communities and try to institutionalize their practices. Concrete examples, the platform for mortgage affected people in Barcelona and across Spain. Yeah, they, the, by, this was at the back of uh, 300,000 families being left homeless because they could not repay their mortgage um, debt. They, they got together, they formed a real community, not an imaginary or forced community. And they tried to institute change by declaring housing at, as the commons. They did all sorts of innovative things like occupying buildings belonging to the banks that evicted them. But most importantly, part of the a branch of this movement gave, um, uh, who, who was led by Ada Kalau, Ada Kalau from that movement became mayor of Barcelona. And she started together with this group, instituting change. Another uh, example is um, the movement um, that came out of the, the um, um, efforts to privatize water in Greece, in Thessaloniki, the second biggest city of Greece. And what uh, this movement did, they called them themselves 136. And they tried to rethink uh, water provision, not as a technical or managerial, but not whether it should be private or public, but as a political question. So what they did, they got together with a hundred municipalities approximately, and their name refers to the, the amount of euros, 136 euros it would take for each citizen to put in, in order to buy back this um, water company and make it commons if it came up for for privatization. And the, the important thing about this movement is actually that they, they did it. They raised 1 billion euros uh, as guarantee funds. They got support from across the world, including the former av advisor to Margaret Thatcher's privatization programs. And they were up there bidding for Thessaloniki's water against global corporate giants like Suez Water and Mercorot. Now, why I single out this movement, why it's important, is because it turned the question of water from a false techno-managerial dilemma into a real political question. 
it posed a real political question, not only to policymakers, but also to each citizen. It asked each citizen, if you had 136 euros, would you keep them in your pocket as buying capacity, consumer capacity, or would you turn it into real capital? What is real capital? It is the ability to make decisions over the use, management, and allocation of water resources in your own city. This is real politics, and yeah. they did it. So what I argue is um, we should retrain ourselves to fine-grained methods, ethnographic methods, not to become ethnographers, but simply to try to, to be there, to engage with these communities and groups that do things differently, to capture their radical imaginaries and try to institutionalize them through pilots or not, and also to dare to retrain our, uh, to, to reset our training agendas. We need to, in the in universities, we need to train planners that will think for themselves, that mm -hmm. will open their eyes to these alternatives and embrace the role of a public intellectual. And I heard a lot about risk of failure. Do we really think these experimentations are risky? What we're doing, we are already in, in disaster. What can possibly be more risky than the situation we are today in? I think the risk we take by continuing to invest in failed, failed methods of the past again and again and again is much higher than the risk to experiment with all this. And yes, okay, we may fail again, but the point is to try and fail better next time. That's what planning has been doing. And that's why we have been in the forward of visionary change. Let's try and fail better. Let's dare to do that.